Okay, thanks, Bill. And all right, this time this is my part of the talk, more so that uh, the results of the of the wharf simulations. And Andy did almost all of the uh, observational data preparation and so forth. And and uh, my co-authors here are, are again Andy, uh, Hugh Morrison, and Roy Rasmussen. So I'll tell you very quickly about the experiment design. It was using uh, uh, WARF version 3.11. It has uh, 600 by 300 grid points in these uh, simulations. They're very idealized. 50 meter horizontal spacing, uh, numerous vertical levels here in order to get high resolution through uh, the cloud layer and the subcloud layer, um, starting out with 150 down low, but decreasing down to 50 and then increasing to 250 meter spacing. So just really stretching the coordinate to maximize the levels in the cloud. Um, using this Thompson et al. 2008 uh, bulk microphysics, we put in a purposeful adiabatic liquid water cloud content uh, that's 150 meters deep, centered about seven kilometers at temperature of minus 30. Uh, no ice is allowed to initiate. Um, this bulk microphysics package would otherwise have ice initiating as soon as you start the model at, uh, at these kinds of temperatures at liquid saturation. It's just, if you don't do that, I don't. I don't know any modeler that wouldn't do that, um, but we purposely had that all those processes shut down. But then uh, for 60 seconds at about the 30 minute mark in the model run, we put in 100 ice crystals per liter in just four by four patch of pixels. So certainly more uh, footprint, if you will, than what a real aircraft is, but we're not down at the meter scale here. We're at 50 meters uh, horizontal spacing. In total, we ran three. Uh, simulations. The first one is just going to be a control experiment with everything turned on essentially uh, once this ice initiates. Um, after that, we turned off the latent heating due to depositional growth of, uh, of any ice species, whether it's ice category or snow category. And the last one, oh, I'm sorry, but then we left on the latent cooling by evaporating drops because um, some of these water drops are going to evaporate as the uh, Bergeron process really kicks in and the vapor migrates from the water to the ice. So that, that cooling effect is left in place in this no latent heat run. And then a third run where we turned off even that effect. So here's actually two skew T's from that uh, case I showed of the satellite image in the last talk. And what we have here is the only layer of clouds way up here at uh, 380 mill millibars at about minus 30 Celsius. There's an inversion. And the liquid water cloud is at right at this inversion. This is the uh, Shreveport, Louisiana sounding. This is the Dallas, Fort Worth sounding. I also had ones from Little Rock, Arkansas, Lake Charles, Louisiana, and Oklahoma City, and they all show this exact same feature at this at this altitude. So it's a that that satellite image showed it very well too. It's an extremely widespread feature. Um, the date here is, yeah, January 29 of 2007. These are the 12Z soundings, and this feature was present essentially the whole day long, so it was a very good case. Um, so, you know, we do have to take some of this data and smooth it out a bit, so here's what was actually put into the, into the WARF model. Um, the darker red and green are the, are the uh, idealized version, and underneath you can sort of see the the more noisy data is the real sounding. In this case, underneath is the Fort Worth sounding. We put in a very idealized uh, wind shear profile so that we weren't having to uh, worry about making the domain even larger because this real case, the winds were blowing 50 meters per second. So we just took, w took away essentially the 50 meters per second and left in about a, a two meter per second um, shear uh, over that shear layer over the cloud layer of 150 meters deep. Um, here's another picture that uh, Andy picked up. I forget where this one was located, but a classical whole cloud as we're trying to model here, and this turns out to be what we ended up modeling that I'll show here. So to give you a um, background on the next set of graphics, um, the dark gray parallelograms here are the upper level cloud at about uh, minus 30 Celsius. This is the cloud liquid water content. It's just constant, so it's just a sheet of clouds up here. And um, uh, I think it reached a maximum of just less than 0.1 grams per cubic meter of liquid water content. So in this reference, the wind is basically at one meter per second here, but there's two meters, of, uh, two meters per second of, of shear in this depth of 150 meters. And the gold colors are going to represent the cloud ice. So this is at the moment I've inserted the, the ice into the simulation. 
and it does show below the cloud deck because I let it be anywhere where it was ice saturated. So this simulation is also purposefully ice saturated below the cloud level, but not water saturated. And then when blue appears, that will be the snow. So ice in this model is considered less than 200 micron uh, diameter, and as it grows, it transitions into the snow category and starts falling much faster. So starting out here at uh, 10 minutes prior to turning on the ice, on the left panel will be control, and on the right panel will be the results when we turned off the latent heating due to ice uh, growth. There's still, again, uh, latent cooling to, dr to droplet evaporation, though. And now we, there's the uh, inserted ice, so they look the same at this time. Ten minutes later, another ten minutes, 30 now since inserting ice, 40, 50. And notice the main difference here is that the one with uh, full latent heating is developing a hole there. The gold, again, is the cloud ice. The blue is the snow. And on the no latent heating case, we basically hardly have any hole anymore. The ice has grown um, by the available vapor since it was above ice saturation, but it essentially just falls out. And 70 minutes, 80, 90, 100, 110. So I'll go ahead and let that loop a little faster so you can sort of appreciate the time sequence. You can see certainly the, the left image is growing a cloud hole quite efficiently. It's actually surprised me quite a bit how, how well that shows up. So uh, another view of that here is now just looking at a, a cross section through it. On the left side of panels, um, time goes down um, uh, from top to bottom. On the left panel is gray representing the cloud water, colors here representing uh, vertical, vertical velocity. Um, contours representing downward vertical velocity, so shaded, think of up, and regular contours, think of down. And um, on the right-hand side, the contours represent cloud ice, and the colors represent snow. So you can more or less see that same thing where cloud ice occurs because of the freezing of those droplets right away and then growing to snow and falling out. But what I want you to notice most is that the vertical velocities here on the left panel, so that latent heating effect is giving off enough um, vertical velocity to actually sustain this cloud. It's actually sort of <coughs> lofting those ice particles and keeping them in place where they can continue to grow. Another view of vertical velocity shown here um, on the left panel is again the control and on the right panel is the no latent heating case and it's a remarkable difference of, of you know, 15 to 20 centimeters per second. So that Velocity alone is helping just to sustain that ice in that region of liquid water content, and so it just continues to grow. This is looking downwind, essentially, down um, an average, straight downwind through the hole. So the physical processes are pretty clear. The latent heating from this ice initiation, it produces these weak updrafts that just continually suspend these ice crystals since their terminal velocity is essentially the same as the updraft speed. The water vapor migrates from droplets to ice, of course, it's the Bergeron process shown quite well. The additional latent heat just continues to grow that ice, or sorry, uh, there's more latent heat released as that ice just continues to grow, and the larger ice crystals will start sedimenting below and then sublimating. All that is uh, visible in that animation. Um, compensating downdrafts on the perimeter of that uh, updraft are then also helping to um, encourage even more evaporation of the droplets and cause the hole to grow. And it's sort of this positive feedback loop when you have the latent heating uh, there that wasn't, was obviously not there in the, in the sensitivity experiment without latent heating. I didn't show the results of turning off all latent heating, including latent cooling due to the droplets, because there really is just nothing to show there. The ice just falls through this cloud. It never leaves a hole, and that's the end of it. There, so I didn't even bother to show that sensitivity run, but that has even less uh, excitement, so. <laughs> and I think that's the last slide. Yes. Questions or comments? Dan. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, ask you to see a good simulation that shows the effects of dynamic seeding, but in status. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, would, you, would you be able to, uh, to say uh, to what extent you, you, you do find dynamic effects from uh, edit, uh, 
Alex into convective class to compare? I'm not sure I'm going to be willing to, to venture there. <laughs> uh, it's certainly going to have a feedback, of course. I, I definitely believe so. But dynamics are so strong and so much convection that maybe it wouldn't be as obvious an effect. This is a great effect to use a very benign cloud, essentially. <laughs> Yes. I was just wondering how important is the wind shear? I was only two meters per second uh, up at that. There was so thin a cloud layer too. I mean, and besides, I didn't want to sort of tear the thing apart too quickly, so I really kept it a bit under control. So in reality, there might have been as much as four meters per second across it, and I only used about half that. Do you think that would make a difference whether if there's high wind shear that this would inhibit somehow the circulation process? Uh, I think it. W I think it would. Yes. I think it would. It, it, I'm, in this example and in others, I don't think there's that much shear because it's usually in a very shallow layer anyway. Do you have any idea what the ice particle concentration, what minimum ice particle concentration would be required to produce a hole? That's very interesting because my first is a great question. Because my uh, <coughs> first attempts at this, I didn't have enough ice crystal concentration and I couldn't get the effect very strongly. And it was also a, my first attempt was a deeper. Uh, cloud, a liquid water cloud of more like 250 or 300 meters deep and with maybe only one particle per liter, one crystal per liter and the effect was almost invisible back, or it, it was gone too quickly, it was there and gone too quickly. I had to go to a thinner cloud with more crystals to really pull this result out well. So the inferences in the real holes, those airplanes are making quite a few ice crystals. Yeah, my guess is that it's pretty close concentrations to what the cloud droplet concentrations were, so which is certainly more than one per liter.